So in today's lecture, I'd like to continue our discussion of scaling laws. If you haven't already watched those videos, please go back and do so. <coughs> I have a, a lecture on scaling laws for mechanics and the scaling laws for electricity and magnetism. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about scaling laws for heat. Now remember, um, when we talk about scaling laws, what we're saying is that uh, you're looking at how the phenomenon changes as the size of the particle changes. And so I'm interested not so much in an in-depth discussion of how that applies here, but how the uh, big scale equations that we use in some of our introductory courses, how those concepts scale as the particle size changes. So in a way, I'm kind of doing a dimensional analysis of these equations. All right, so um, heat transfer. So first, let's talk about the amount of heat that it takes to increase the temperature of a substance. So we remember from our introductory physics course that the amount of heat, Q, that it takes to increase the uh, temperature of a substance by an amount delta T here. Uh, typically, we give the units for our change in temperature in either Celsius or Kelvin. Since it's a change in temperature, either is appropriate. Um, that amount of energy can be described by Q is equal to m times little c times delta t, which is equal to big C times delta t, okay? So here, m is the mass of the uh, particle or substance. C is the specific heat. In other words, the amount of energy per unit kilogram normalized for the mass. And then big C would be the heat capacity, and that heat capacity includes the mass, okay? So um, if we assume that the specific heat of the substance is a material property that does not scale as the size of the particle decreases, then that means that the um, heat capacity C, big C, is going to be proportional to the mass, right? And the mass, we saw in a previous lecture, is proportional to the density of the material, which is a material property which doesn't scale um, as the size of the particle changes, okay? So this is our assumption here. It's proportional to the density times the volume of the particle. Now, in previous lectures, we spoke of a characteristic dimension, big D, okay? And the characteristic dimension sort of describes the phenomena that we're looking at um, with respect to the size of the particle or substance that we have. So D would be the characteristic dimension or the characteristic size that controls that phenomena for your material. So it could be a film thickness, for example, if you're looking at a, a film, right, film thickness. Or if you're looking at a spherical nanoparticle, it could be the radius, right? So here, we're saying that C is proportional to D cubed because big C, the heat capacity, is proportional to the mass, which is proportional to the volume. And the volume would be the characteristic dimension cubed. So C is proportional to D cubed here. All right, so that means that since we have the amount of heat transfer um, is proportional to some material constant and then also uh, the mass, then that means that the heat is also proportional to d cubed, okay? Um, as a note here, uh, I use slightly different symbols in my equation than the textbook Nanotechnology Understanding Small Systems does, okay? Um, I use the more conventional Q to describe the amount of energy in joules. However, in that textbook, they're using Q uh, to describe the power or the rate of heat transfer, okay? So just bear that in mind as you're reading. I'm using the choices that you might see in most introductory physics texts. I think that would be more familiar to my students, but. Okay, now we're also interested, interested by the way, in the um, rate of energy transfer by heat. Okay, now there's several ways this can occur. You can have conduction, convection, or radiation. Now for nano-sized particles, um, radiation is really the least important and most heat transfer takes place via conduction or convection. So I'm gonna focus in this discussion on those two mechanisms for heat transfer. Now just to remind you a little bit, conduction and convection require physical contact between substances or a medium, right? Radiation is the only one that can occur in a vacuum, okay, for example. So conduction is the transfer of heat on an atomic scale caused by basically collisions in between particles, okay? So it's an exchange of kinetic energy between microscopic particles by collisions. And those can be free electrons, for example, the free electrons in a metal, 
Um, or it could be, for example, uh, a direct uh, collision in between uh, molecules that are touching one another in some way. Okay? In those collisions, less energetic particles gain energy and they get warmer, and more energetic particles lose it, and then the energy is spread or transferred throughout the material. Now, the rate of conduction depends upon the characteristics of that substance. So in general, metals are good thermal conductors because they have all those free electrons that just roam around, right? But poor conductors include things like asbestos, paper, and then in comparison, gases. So conduction can only occur if there's a difference in temperature between two parts of the conducting medium. Other than that, you don't have any net conduction of energy. You have some transfer back and forth, of course, but no net conduction. So the rate of transfer of energy via conduction we learn about in our introductory physics courses. It's a power, it's an energy transfer per unit time. And so I write that as the power P, curly P, the power, is equal to the heat that is transferred, which here I, I call Q, divided by the change in time, which I use time little t, Q over delta T. Now that power is equal to Ka times the absolute value of dt dx. Okay? So dt dx, the big T here is the temperature. So it's the temperature difference uh, in between uh, over a certain distance characterized by dx or delta x. So you have to have a temperature gradient, a spatial temperature gradient, in order to have energy transfer. A there is the cross-sectional area through which you're trying to transfer that heat energy. So for example, if you're talking about heat transfer across a window pane, it might be the area that you see looking at the window when you're looking out the window. And then K um, is the thermal conductivity of the, of the material. Now, of course, good conductors have high K values and good insulators have low K values, all right? So how do we scale this, all right? If you do dimensional analysis on this equation, then you would see that the power is proportional to D. If you assume that K, the thermal conductivity, is a material property that doesn't change with scale. But that turns out to be a poor assumption in nanoscale systems. Now we're going to get into a deeper discussion of this in a later chapter and write out some equations um, for how we describe the thermal conductivity. But for now, understand that the thermal conductivity scales as the characteristic dimension d. And the reason for this, in general, is that as particles become smaller, what happens if you think about it, let's say that you have these uh, electrons that uh, are causing the heat transfer, the free electrons, right? Well, those have a mean free path, so they transfer, they, they travel a certain distance before they collide with something else. Okay, so that's their mean free path. Now, if you have a nano-sized particle, then the effective mean free path of the energy carriers could be uh, larger, right, than the size of the particle itself. So, for example, the mean free path of a conduction electron in bulk copper might be longer than the size of the copper nanoparticle that you have. Okay? So, if that's the case, then as you scale your material down, the thermal conductivity would drop just because there are more collisions because it collides with the walls of the particle that it's in. All right, So it becomes limited by size. We're going to have a more in-depth discussion about that later, but conceptually that's the explanation for it. And so looking at this, that means that the power is going to scale as d squared, okay? because you have that extra d dependence um, from your uh, from your um, equation there. So here we have the power is equal to K, which scales as D, times the area, which scales as, um, you know, D squared. And then we're dividing by DX, which scales as D. And so that leaves us D squared there. All right, now let's talk about convection, okay? Convection is energy transferred due to the circulation of a medium, like air or water. And we usually, of course, think of this medium as a fluid. We model it in physics as a fluid. All right? Now, when you do this, um, the uh, first order equation that describes the, the rate of energy transfer via convection is Newton's law of cooling. Okay? So, Newton's law of cooling says as follows. You have some power for energy transfer. And that power is dependent upon the temperature difference between points, um, between two points in the medium. Okay, so if there's a temperature gradient within your medium, then that will cause the medium to circulate, right? And power 
will get uh, energy, heat energy will be transferred. So that power is equal to the heat, Q, that's transferred divided by the time, delta T. And that is equal to HA times the change in temperature or the temperature gradient delta big T. All right. So here H is the heat transfer coefficient, and that's a function of how fast the fluid or medium moves. A here is the cross-sectional area, similarly to our conduction equation from before. And that would make the power there proportional to d squared. All right, so if you do dimensional analysis on there and you assume that the heat transfer coefficient does not depend upon size, then that would make your power proportional to d squared. Now, this works okay for larger length scales, but once you get down to the you know, micrometer length scale or below, this breaks down. And that's because this Newton's law cooling falls out of some second order uh, differential equations, diffusion equations, and the assumptions of those equations break down as the length scales get small. And yet again, this is because of the mean free path, right? The mean free path of the uh, particles within the medium or fluid could be longer or larger than the dimension of the container for sub-micrometer scale structures. Okay, so we'll talk more about that later, but when that breaks down, um, then you can't depend on this equation or scaling law anymore. Now finally, I'd like to take, talk about the amount of time that it takes something to come to thermal equilibrium. All right, so a lot of our assumptions in thermodynamics, for example, assume thermal equilibrium, but we all understand that it takes time for a system to come to thermal equilibrium. So if I place two substances in thermal contact, for example, and there's a temperature difference in between those two, there will be an amount of time that, that um, it takes for those systems to come to thermal equilibrium. Now, if you're waiting for thermal equilibrium, the equation that you probably see most of the time is in terms of what we call the Fourier number, which I've indicated here by F0, all right? So F0 here is equal to alpha times tau over L squared. And the time to thermal equilibrium in this equation is given by tau. So F0 is dimensionless. Okay, so this is a dimensionless thing, right? Of course, L is the length scale of interest, which would, in this case, be our characteristic dimension D. And alpha is a material parameter, again, something that we don't consider within our dimensional analysis. So if you solve for tau, tau would be uh, L squared F0 over alpha. And since F0 and alpha have no length dependence there, then that means that the time to thermal equilibrium is proportional to d squared. Now this makes sense really, okay? If you have a larger particle, it's going to take longer for it to come to thermal equilibrium than a smaller particle, okay? All right, um, that's what I'd like to uh, talk about in this lecture today. If you have any questions, let me know, and as always, I'll see you in class.